Right, welcome back, everybody, to the Christian Masculinism Show, episode 12, Return to the Land. How is it that Christian men can protect and feed their families uh, is the answer for the 21st century to, uh, to go ahead and return back to the land, flee to the fields, as uh, Father McNabb pointed out. Uh, joining me today, as usual, we have Timothy Gordon, Elliot Hulse, and Will Nolan. Uh, you guys go around the horn real quick, introduce yourselves, and we can just jump right into this topic. Sure. I got fired from Eton College in the UK for a lecture on masculinity. And since then, I've found some like minds in this group, and we're articulating some traditional principles to help people find their way. Elliot I got Hulse. fired from... Go ahead. Oh. Talk about being fired, man. You fired guys. Go first. <laughs> you didn't even get <laughs> fired, Elliot. So what are you No, talking? I never worked for anybody. Uh, yeah. <laughs> With we're, we're reverse snobs on this channel, where if you didn't get fired, then you go last. So, sorry, man. That's right. Uh, I also got fired as a school teacher for presumably a triple tweet attacking Black Lives Matter, Globo Homo, and Islam. And since then, I relocated to Mississippi, which is a big part of Return of the Land, I think, and have been a full-time content maker and podcaster. You can go to Timothy Gordon on YouTube. Sorry, Elliot. Well, I'm the full-time unemployed guy, never been employed, always been a <laughs> jobless, broke SOB. And uh, I've been on YouTube, though, since 2007 making men strong again, strong man, strength coach, and here strengthening up our reserves, our forces for bringing back holiness in our whorish world. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. And I myself, Dr. Michael Robillard, ex-military, uh, uh, former ranger, former Oxford, and uh, happy to join these gentlemen here to talk about the topic today which is return to the land this topic has come up several times in our earlier episodes so i thought that it was uh worthy of devotion to an entire episode and in recent years we've seen catholics and christians begin to try to revive the 1930s catholic land movement it was started by father uh, McNabb and uh had its origins with uh belloc and chesterton and uh, whatnot. So I'm just wondering to what degree you gentlemen think that this could be a plausible answer to some of the the nastiness of the, the world that we've been talking about in, in some of these earlier episodes and, and what might that begin to look like? You see people doing it. I catch him on YouTube. There's this guy, Father Dowell. Dowell, I think his name, big black dude. He's a pastor and he uh, He's like in the Ozarks somewhere. Mm. I see other guys who mainly in the Ozarks who are like gathering people of like-minded value, virtue, and faith, uh, mostly Protestants, just to be completely transparent, um, who are setting themselves apart and live by that mantra and making themselves self-sufficient. I'm really impressed when I watch Pastor Dow. He's got a bunch of guys building houses like the Amish do. Uh, they have their own chickens. They have their own... Uh, dare I say, mini militia, right, to protect themselves. Um, I think he repeats this often, but of course it's biblical that we're called to set ourselves apart. I think a big part of what has happened over the past 100 years, I guess, or so, you guys are better historians than me, is that Catholics have allowed ourselves to be totally assimilated into the world. And there's no distinction between Catholics and the run-of-the-mill, regular, modernist, mind-numbing, dummy. And so uh, this would be a physical means by which we do it. And I, I can't help but to think that it's on its way and it's kind of happening already. So it's pretty cool that we're talking about it today. Nice. Nice. Yeah. The British historian, Christopher Dawson, who was Catholic, he said that if the state has become too totalitarian, it's because the church hasn't been totalitarian enough. So to the extent that agrarianism is about affirming a distinctly catholic culture then i think it's a good pushback against the ever encroaching secular state agreed agreed with all that i i'm concerned that returning to the land would be while exquisitely moral and 
uh, in a vacuum uh, solution to the problems, I'm concerned that it would be subject to the same scheme of robust hypertaxation and uh, top-down collectivist control that everything in America has been, and, and Great Britain for that matter. Um, we, we live under a regime, uh, a taking scheme uh, from, you know, from a case called Kilo versus City of New London after 2005, where basically government can take property anytime there's a public use purpose. And so I, I, um, I think it's a, a, a solution to some cultural problems. I don't think it's the solution to all. I think top-down big government is always the problem. And I think even this is even reflected, this torture is reflected even in the writings of uh, Belloc and Chesterton, which, which have a lot of good solutions, but, but advocate for uh, some of the problems that would uh, bedoggle the solution that they offer themselves. So I, I like it. But we still have the problem of big government. And when you have the problem of big government, they can always just come take your land. This is why BlackRock, Bill Gates are buying up all the farmland in America together with a legal regime that could force people to give up their land under Kilo versus City of New London. There are problems. Could you say a bit more about that, Tim? Like, do you think that there's at least maybe like a, a starting point that we could get with respect to the return of the land and then and what do you see the the uh the state pressure like what's the limitation again or what's what's the what's the full solution if if not if not culturally it's a good starting point yeah Mm -hmm. for for sure because i mean people should should in in some sense return to the land uh particularly the catholic sense that you're advocating here uh mike and and I guess we're advocating here today. We're not talking about a Rousseauvian noble savage uh, Mm -hmm. moment of romanticism or something like that. I'm just saying the, the big problem in America is cultural and political. There's a nexus between, you know, licentious, immoral culture invites big government. And like I've said on a bunch of other shows, Catholics, are only addressing the the cultural problem, not the political one. So the, the political one is they're gonna they're gonna take what is ours by birthright or by labor via a robust taxation and taking schemes. And until we set the government square, whatever cultural uh, solutions are proffered by a land movement mm-hmm. are gonna be still jeopardized under jeopardy but mm-hmm. yes it's a cult it's a cultural movement that i see is tremendously valuable nice nice well, on one hand you know we could talk about the land but on the other hand we can talk about services and it's been the outsourcing of services to both government and quasi-government organizations that has really stripped us of our power i believe that prior to uh just a few decades ago that it was mostly the Catholic church that brought forth the hospitals and the orphanages and the schools and the universities. And it was all these things that we now take for granted that Uncle Sam or big government is going to take care of. It, the Catholic community took care of. And also the small grassroots community, local community is the one where you would find like a teacher. Like, you know, uh, why is there not first of all, more homeschooling, but then second of all, why do we have to bus our kids off to the city or, you know, miles and miles away? Why do we have to go to a municipal hospital when there are nurses that are that are nurses and doctors that could practice in their own community? Like I see there's another guy, too. Like I said, I see a lot of Protestants doing this. Um, Michael Foster, he's a pastor, Protestant pastor. But what he ends up doing, what he's done is basically infiltrated a small city somewhere and got all his people in place. And so basically the whole the whole government is run by his church. And not only that, they just they just patronize each other's businesses, almost like look like like when um, Asians come to America, Indians come to America, the Amish have stayed to themselves for hundreds of years. 
So rather than, you know, thinking, go back to the land, that's cool, right? Because of course the land will produce for us, but how about go back to our community for providing the services that we have been hoping and expecting uh, Uncle Sam to take care of? That, that's an excellent point, uh, Elliot. Uh, another uh, example of this is Moscow, Idaho. That it's um, where, um, forgetting that Calvinist that's a, a, a blown up right now, Doug, Doug Wilson, where mm-hmm. he points out mm-hmm. that, yeah, like almost the whole town is on board with that type of economic scheme that y- you mentioned. So he's not worried about getting canceled and nobody else is. Because, okay, maybe you can cancel one or two people. You can't cancel a whole town. So they just shrug their shoulders and they go, okay, well, whatever. Call us whatever you want. And then they just, they go about their business. Another instance, Dearborn, Michigan, uh, with the Muslim community, they they don't care about getting canceled. All their economic interactions, they're all internal. So I think that type of, that 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 economic localism, at the very least, I think, is such a uh, such an important ethic to return to. Yeah, well, imagine... But- Muslims and Jews are both good at supporting each other's businesses. And one of the things that happened during the Enlightenment is that people like Hobbes, Rousseau, were hostile to any kind of intermediary associations between the individual and the state. So you break down all those corporations. They broke down the family itself and saw the individual as the main unit of society, not the family. But beyond the family, you get the professional associations. And of course, you get the church itself and religion as one of the hierarchical structures of what Catholicism sees as the organic, natural structure of society. When all that goes, what you basically have is just the individual and then the state mopping everything up. And that's what we've seen with food production, for example, as well, where some of the smaller farms have been put out of business and being bought up by basically huge corporations instead. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a a great, great remark to set this one up. I mean, imagine what would happen if it wasn't just a town that in some obscure slip through the cracks away in the 21st century operated on the basis of localism and subsidiarity. Imagine if it was an entire state, which is what this country really was until uh, the 20th century, the middle 20th century. And that's, that's when you had a lot of, a lot more people farming. Yes, but you actually didn't live under a tyrannical legal regime where Washington DC governed everything, you know, your, your state could make porn contraception, sodomy, abortion, gay marriage illegal. And your state was uh, an official establishment of one of the Christian sects that goes together like a wink and a nod with the idea of being truly self-sustaining and producing your own food, because you know, that you're two valences of separation away from having D.C. sticking its nose into your business. You have literally the state protection and the municipal protection. Instead, everything got shipped to Washington, D.C. There are no protections and and people, because the technology stopped farming their own stuff, and now we just live under a a federal hegemony from Washington, D.C. They tell us what to think and what to eat and when to eat it, and they have... Uh, and it's whatever food choices they deign for us. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a, a completely correct description of yeah where where we are and and uh, what's what's keeping us there. Um, so if I could just read something from Father McNam's uh, essay, uh, uh, return uh, the Catholic land movement, not not flee the fields. He mentions of the the side effects of returning to the fields. What this would do. He says that it would bring, uh, you know, various disparate economic groups together. Uh, further consequence will result in the greater abundance of the fruits of the earth. Men always work harder on what belongs to them. Nay, they learn to love the very soil that yields in response to the labor of their hands. Not only food to eat, but an abundance, abundance of good things for themselves. And then lastly, so the third advantage would spring from this. Men would cling to the country in which they were born, for no one would exchange their country for a foreign land if his own afforded him the means of living a decent and happy life. 
And I think that that like it gets back to the point of citizenship. It gets back to national defense where, you know, pe- people would live and, and die to defend their their family and their land where they live. You mentioned this D.C. structure. Now people get sent off to go fight and kill for some bullshit war that has very little relevance to defense of their own home. So that's where that's for me. That's where my stake in this very much is: is that the the rootedness in the land lends itself to to local national defense as well, not not this you know dis- disparate foreign pol- policy. Yeah, rootedness in land. I see the value in nationalism. Rootedness, even in dare I say, as a mixed man, uh, race. You know, uh, a lot of the a lot of the mixing of ideals and culture and open borders and blending of people, uh, I think, leads to distrust and a lack of cohesive ability to even get together and and work together. Um, I guess that's what the dream of. And here's kind of a question, because, you know, I ponder these things. The Catholic Church. Is like the is like the first new world order. Would you say like, because with the Catholic church, I think ultimately the the goal was or is to be universal and that all these boundaries that I'm like proposing and now I'm kind of contradicting myself um, that would allow for a a solid, strong sense of cohesion and community. um, Maybe maybe we're maybe we're called away from that now I'm, I'm backtracking because as a catholic right it's a matter of being universal it's the church for everybody but that doesn't mean that we have to lose our boundaries we have to lose our lose ourselves in total blending and homo- homogenization um anyway just some some pondering for that of course the world that we live in today is, in many ways is an ape of the church i like that i learned that i learned that language from being catholic there's an ape <laughs> There's, I guess, the fake version of various things. Um, and it's like the new world order as we see it today with like the whole homogeny and like, it really does not honor diversity at all because it's like, they say they claim they want you to be diverse, but at the same time, no, they want you to be blended in in the same lukewarm and gray mm-hmm. like everybody else, uh, you know, co- co- commoditized. Um, so maybe like, I don't, I don't even know where this conversation is going. I'm just ranting because I had too much coffee today. But the, the 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 idea that you know maybe what we're experiencing is the frustration of a co-opted ape version of what the Catholic Church was hoping to establish or intended to establish, but then was hijacked by New World Orderism. Anyway, no, I think that's right. I think liberalism is, in a sense, a Christian heresy because it takes the idea of everyone being equally made in the image of God and then perverts that and strips of its spiritual basis. So you get this obsession with equality and yeah, all are one in Christ and that transcends racial tribalism, but you can't do that without a shared religion to bind multiple ethnicities into one culture. And I think the West is finding out painfully that race isn't sufficient to sustain the culture that a religion built. Mm. Yeah. Also, there are there are uh, sort of safe safety ties uh, that the anti-modernist popes around the turn of the twentieth century insist on. Elliot, the Church wants us to be Catholic with a small c insofar as we all celebrate the same liturgy and the same sacraments. But, and even even this distinction ends up being weaponized later around Vatican II, each locality can do so, uh, uh, even if we had one, one great big liturgy, even if we only had one Roman rite, uh, gasp. You could still do so according to your, your, your local customs. Uh, I mean, those... Uh, modifications and uh, abilities to have a local spin on them are afforded by even the rubrics. So 
to have the same liturgy and sacraments worldwide doesn't mean the same political traditions worldwide. Uh, that there is enough diversity, true diversity carved carved into that. Like, which is why the church never, ever, ever confused itself with the state. When you look past the uh, the modern imaginings, the the way we never were type imaginings of folks like Adrian Vermeule or Patrick Deneen. They don't, the church never fancied itself the governing overlord. All they want to be uniform is liturgy, sacraments, creed, uh, obviously creed, beginning with the latter first. But they, they, they know that the ways of living, habits of space, you, you know, relationship to the land, you know, how, which is called to be autochthonous. It's a fancy Greek word to impress people at dinner parties. There will be absolutely culture and ethnicity specific relations uh, that, that that inform each of these ways of life that are specific to all the different places and spaces on the globe. That, that's a good point, Tim. That just made me think that we talked about this a bit before, where it's like if you put Catholics together in a local region and they start doing Catholic things, then there's going to be families. And then you run that iteration over a long enough time, then you're going to have big families. You're going to have extended families. You're going to have large kinship groups. Then you're going to have connections of those kinship groups. And then you're going to have, I don't know, a, a nation that has an ethnic, a deep ethnic component to it. Right. So, it, so what ends up happening is that like just a side effect of like Catholics doing Catholic things and ethnic a unique ethnic side effect of it just emerges. So then people go, well, you know, what, what about ethnic supremacy of this, that, or the other thing? It's just like, well, it's not supremacist. It's just a side effect of doing Catholic things. You know, I, I don't, I think that those things end up being inseparable to some extent. Yeah. A side effect of doing Catholic things when the view of what a nation is isn't impeded by, if I can not to put too fine a point on it, but modern Catholic LARPing that, that I referred to in my last comment, like if a nation is the size of a continent, the way that all these Catholic guys say they want a Catholic nation, they're talking about a Catholic nation that's si the size of like the Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Well, then under that rubric, which is actually no different than the modern liberal orders rubric nations need to be way 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 smaller and both the the new catholic nationalists christian nationalists the big liberal order they all want common continent hemisphere globe sized government and that's just wrong under that perspective to say ethnic loyalty or something like that sounds scary and and, and maybe is i don't know i haven't thought about it enough whereas when a nation is a city state and it's based on trust the way Elliot or Will said in their opening remarks, just the trust that you have with your, your kinsmen, you know, like a, like a Hamlet in Scotland or something like that. Then all of a sudden people are like, Oh, that's what a nation is. It's literally just a, a kinship group and, and, and smaller is beautiful. And when these people are farming the land in a certain way and they focus on certain crops because it's guaranteed by some combination of preference along with the climate and the topography and vegetation of their local space. This makes a lot of sense. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't farm this way and they wouldn't enjoy even the same uh, preparation of food if they lived a hundred miles to the North. So in order to truly talk about, you know, being back to the land, we do have to talk about what it means to trust in uh, kinship groups that's that's the way humanity really took off and then we still can put it all in order even under that schematization uh Pius the 12th addresses this and says well religion's still you know way 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 more important than ethnicity for culture building but they both do matter but they mm -hmm. both matter when smaller is beautiful mm -hmm. and we're talking about you know city state type nations mm -hmm. nice does uh, Roger Scruton had an interesting line, British conservative thinker, that land and people take their character from each other. And I think that's been really underestimated because there's actually some research that was done on 
what land can do to what people thought was the real hardline dividing line between different racial or ethnic groups, which was in old fashioned terms, like the dimensions of the skull, the shape of the skull. And they looked at how the skulls of second, third generation immigrants changed in response to different environments. And there are actually measurable differences, even in something as empirically hard as the bones of the skull to acting with a different environment. So Tim, what you were saying there about what kind of food you grow, what weather you're working in, what your symbiotic relationship to the land is, I think that's spot on because it does build a particular kind of local culture, even physically in the people. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes so, that's so much sense. The uh, yeah, and it does it gives the character of that that particular region. It, yeah, it's its own its own uniqueness, and uh, that's that is a feature that is a thick feature of identity that I think we've largely lost, and that's been replaced with like I don't know sports team identity or um, political party affiliation or hobbies you know like the you guys familiar with this term bug man you've seen this floating around the internet at all the the, the bug man uh this is just the 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 root, rootless like city like mega city one living apartment guy who is not who's deracinated he's not tied into a people or a land or a religion he's just he's the 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 ideal consumer and i think that the way things are going the the bug man is will be the emergent 21st century automated man if we're we're not taking steps to to, to yeah. fend it off yeah ultimately so i i learned this term um it's standardization and it's a it's an economic term which basically means like look wherever you go if you go to a target it's going to be a target right mm -hmm. wherever you go you're going to mcdonald's it's going to be a mcdonald's so we standardized the the delivery of goods but the standardization of the culture or i.e the whole world so that you know so, how someone's going to respond to the environment of a mcdonald's based on how they've decided and then produce that but then in order to make the whole world easily manipulatable, i.e. what we saw in 2020, where the whole world went into mm -hmm. lockstep with the demands of a few, we have to standardize culture. And so any differentiation between us is a threat mm -hmm. to those who want to be able to have the, the greatest leverage with the least amount of effort. Tell everybody the same story. Get, tell everybody to jump and they'll all, all ask how high is essentially yeah. where we are right now. And by doing so, of course, it's easier to sell us stuff. I even heard that this was the case in terms of uh, generations. This whole idea of, of lateral generations is sort of new mm. uh, as opposed to vertical generations. In other words, there was a time when like a, a, a son, his father, and his grandfather had more in common with each other than do, you know, all the kids of the same age. But in order to be able to sell more of the same product to the same people. You have to have them with the same mindset. And so you standardize a particular generation with a mindset that will cause them to say how high when you jump or, or uh, you know, react to a particular stimulus. So that's where we are right now in terms of like, it is a religion. We are <laughs> under one culture. It's just freaking Mickey Mouse, McDonald's, uh, mm -hmm. Levi jeans culture rather than that of being oriented to our lord certainly yeah you mentioned tim mentioned a uh, global homo in the beginning where i've heard that is a uh, you know it's a short for what a global homosexual but it's also short for global homogenation so and those things end up being wow. one and the same right so it's and the, 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 they're both features of of rampant consumerism and uh yeah i think that's 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 the new New world order paradigm that we're, we're definitely slipping towards if we're not careful. On, and, on that yeah. point, the return to the land is really about being productive mm. rather than just being consumers. Yes. So it's about not just contact with what St. Augustine called the, the book of nature <clears throat> and being in communion with God via created physical reality. It's also about producing, not just consuming. And this is why I think Tim's opening remark about the importance of private property is really crucial 
in the Catholic Encyclopedia entry on agrarianism, we get the line, as grace rests on nature, the religion that is alone truly divine must also, ipso facto, be truly human. But the instinct of private property is truly human. And the proper unfolding of human liberty and personality is historically bound up with it and cannot develop where each person is only a sharer in a compulsory partnership, or, on the other hand, where property is confined to a privileged few. So unless we've got that bedrock of private property rights, all this talk about families and building strong communities and being able to pass that down through generations is really resting on something that is insufficiently secure to give it any kind of proper foundation. Mm. Father, Will, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm curious, Will, since you, you just um, published a, a few things on integralism, what do you think of the mate in America, the major critics of liberalism that would at least claim to like some of the stuff you've been writing lately are also critics of the rights tradition. They say, oh, rights, rights aren't a real thing. They're not a Catholic thing. And this is totally wrong, um, according to me, but rights are, aren't, aren't a real thing. You know, liber liberty rights, you know, Matt Patrick Deneen says, well, you know, liberty fails and everything's basically the fault of liberty, which just is the condition of the soul. You know, we're not Calvinists, but liberty rights and even property rights, which Thomas Aquinas discusses, uh, these are really the creatures of modern, liberal, post-enlightenment, democratic order. What, like, what do you, what do you, where are you on that? Uh, I'm, I'm curious. This is a little bit, not too far afield from the back to the land movement. Where are you on modern rights? I mean, you, you just affirmed it. I affirm it. You know, the, 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 the political rights tradition, but. Uh, how does that square into this analysis? Yeah, so it's true that pre-enlightenment, nobody really talked about individual human rights, but they still talked about the right as a concept pertaining to justice. Now, what kind of things are owed to parents in justice under the common good? Well, things like the right to educate their children the right for their kids not to be taken away by the state and educated instead. Now, if they're going to be doing this, then they need to have a home as well. The family needs a home. That's something it's owed in justice. So that's where you get private property from. But this isn't the same thing as talking about someone having, say, the, the human right, the individual right to an abortion or to free porn or to gay marriage, because all of those things make no sense given the overarching concept of the common good. So of course we have individual rights in a sense in that it's what owed, it's what's owed to us um, by justice and duty given the common good. So the people saying that there's no such thing as the right to private property have misunderstood what the basis of the whole concept is. But do you think that it's, it's, uh, individual rights simplicitaire that has led the modern liberal order astray i because I, I don't it, to yeah. say well life liberty and property which are three absolute into they are individual rights that we receive qua individuals uh which actually comes from catholic canon law in the medieval world that that's where we stopped just talking about book five the nicomachean ethics uh, uh you know in use and we actually started talking about right around Aquinas's day about individual rights. And yes, the individual rights that get bandied about have changed in the popular culture. You go from life, liberty, property, which the church has always affirmed are actually individual rights. There's no such thing as a right that you get as a collective. And those have been surrogate. They took our life. They took our liberty. They took our property. And now you have the right to like chop your wee wee off. That's a right. But that's not a problem with individual rights. And my big problem, the thing I have that's really scary, that the popular Catholic thinkers like Adrian Vermeule and and uh, Patrick Deneen and, and Sarah Bamari and Gladden Pappen are all talking about, 
is there's a problem with individual rights. And in, the, in, in that sense, they set themselves against Thomas and Bellarmine and Suarez and, you know, Aristotle, because individual rights are a thing. There's no such thing as collective rights, are there? I mean, I think this needs to be pushed back on squarely. If we're going to talk about the land, then we have to say, well, there's no good in pushing people back to cultivate the land when under Kilo versus City of New London, the government can take your land anytime it deigns. Not only there's a public uh, pu purpose, but there's even just a public use. That means the government can take your land whenever they want. And I, the problem is I don't think these Catholic new right post-liberal guys would stand up against that. Their philosophy stands for big government, which gives the government the right to take your land. I think we have to address that first. Sure, you can you can root uh, property rights in natural law to the extent that they've got a point. I think it's been poorly articulated, and what it, the problem really is is any attempt to divorce uh, individual rights from the common good. And if you don't have that concept of the common good, so why is it wrong to uh, murder me, for example? Where does that individual right to life come from? Well, ultimately, it's related to my connection to society and to the common good. If you take away that, then what you're left with is all kinds of absurd individual rights that just pertain to feelings of dignity or, or vague ideas about things that I feel I might have. So you've got to have the common good point. But as soon as you admit that, then we've got the whole natural law tradition, which says no people do have a right to private property. Yeah, we'll have to do a show on it because that I, it's related, but it's a glancing blow to what we're talking about today. Maybe, maybe my next uh, sea mask I'll, I'll do on this on our channel because I, I don't think that this is an accident. I think I think you know these these big government Catholic guys uh, are, are are making intentional errors, and I I don't think they really stand for common good at all. But we'll, we'll have to go into it more deeply on another show. For now, it should suffice to say. You're right. You do have a God-given right to your land. It's not absolute because if someone gets caught in a storm or, or needs a, a piece of your corn, Aquinas says they have a right to it. It's a less absolute right than your liberty is or your life is. But, uh, but private property is yours. And uh, that, that's what we're talking about here today is the, the right that a man owns in the land Leo the 13th is the one that endorsed that he didn't endorse much by John Locke. John Locke was a liberal and was wrong in a lot of ways, but it's uh, Leo the 13th very specifically endorses John Locke's theory that labor converts the land, which is what we're talking about here today, into property. Uh, Aquinas didn't hold this view, but Leo the 13th was a Thomistic pope, and he strongly endorses this Lockean view of uh, labor converting land into property well, and, and that's to do with providing for and protecting families as well and passing it on through generations which is why one of the main ways of weakening the family in, in britain especially some of the older traditional families who are very much rooted in the land was imposing massive death taxes on them basically so you can't pass it on to your sons traditionally that's the way it was done the estates become unmanageable because they're just too expensive. And then the family is the intermediary between like the individual and the state gets broken down. And then you paving the way for a totalitarian state, as many of the Catholic writers have argued, once you weaken the family like that, because it's the final bulwark against mm -hmm. totalitarianism. So I just want to propose this. I don't know very much about this idea, but I have a friend who's been buzzing in my ear about the fact that we opt into the law that we are under and that it is a choice to say, for example, take a social security number. And by doing so, we essentially give ourselves over to the bank run state. And that if we also by a, you know, a, a natural law, right, but by the law of the land <clears throat> have the ability Now I don't know how to do this. And he's talking to me about it and maybe we'll figure it out one day, but ultimately run your business, own your property under a different set of laws, not under the book that has been written by the Federal Reserve Bank or whatever central bank is ruling our government in our world. When we get when we 
have children, for example, and we give them a social security number, we basically then say, okay, now my child is now under the law of this mm -hmm. demonic state where what I'm proposing as a solution potentially <clears throat> to all this is that we have the right to remove ourselves from underneath that law so that if someone does come and say, well, your land no longer belongs to you, you say, wait a second, under what law? Yeah, I'm sure that it would take a lot of money, a lot of effort to, to pull that off because they got bombs and bullets. But the idea is that uh, we have given our permission for them to treat us this way and uh, we could just as easily potentially remove our permission and say, mm. no, you, you have no right to do this to us. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The um, philosopher John Surley makes this distinction between a physical object and a social object. And he says that they are different in their nature, diametrically opposed. So if like a physical object, like a shirt, the more I use it, the more it breaks down. A social object like currency, the more I use it, the stronger it gets. The social security number, the stronger it gets. The more I grant legitimacy to a bank or to my credit score or to some new BS law that comes out of nowhere, the the more I recognize and we collectively recognize it as legitimate, the actually the stronger it gets. So I think that's an excellent point, Elliot, that we we're doing this to ourselves, you know, by by granting legitimacy to 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 this Leviathan that we've um, ensnared ourselves right. in. I mean, think and, about what we were talking about last week in terms of marriage. Like, why do we get a marriage license, right? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know all this stuff when I got married 20 years ago, but I really have to think twice about it right now. It's like, why am I getting the state involved? Why am I bringing my marriage under the law of Satan, essentially? And so why do we continue to do this? I think there will be a movement. There has to be a movement where we we start saying no to their spells it's all it, it, we're all under written spells mm. essentially this is all in thick volumes of books of bullshit they made up and that we just sign ourselves over to most of us have no idea we have no idea what's in those freaking books i think there's some truth to that view but it's important to remember that the the, the catholic view of the state is that it is natural to human beings. It's not just a contract that we pull out of thin air. So human beings are, are naturally social and you don't uh, consent to be part of society. It's there whether you like it or not. And there's also God-given social authority whether you like it or not. So I'd be careful about the view that we're all just ultimately sovereign individuals who can decide whether or not to be under some system of government um, or not, because that means we can just easily withhold any kind of authority from any social institution whatsoever. Same with marriage as well. Um, it's not purely a contract. It's also on one level a sacrament and a, a civic institution at minimum. So there are reasons behind those things. But have they been perverted? Sure. It, but here, this is an important stipulation to that that point. Well, this is again a big, big centerpiece that's missing in the modern post-liberal versus liberal discussion. Yes, for the Catholic, there's no doubt. You're right. There's no doubt about it. Political order and uh, the, the civil civil relationships are natural not synthetic the way you know Locke and Sydney thought absolutely correct but they're only natural when subsidiarity is in play so mm. you know when your when your government's roughly the size of Athens or maybe a little bigger than a city state then the relationships are not just uh, voluntary associations they're natural when you're talking about government that's the size of you know, a federally directed America, you know, uh, what America became in the late 20th century, which we're, we're voluntary associate where well, there's no associations that are small. That no longer is natural that that does uh, through virtual representation. You know, a Hawaii farmer has to ask the permission under FDR to eat his own crops from 5000 miles away, Washington, D.C. That is tyrannical. That is synthetically man-made. That's not natural. Uh, so you can't have government that's that big and that far away. That's that's natural. And Locke and Sydney begin to look right when you try to have continent-wide, hemisphere-wide, globe-wide 
government. And uh, again, this is this is a better, uh, more pertaining topic to uh, the kind of show I want to do next. But it's mm-hmm. it's very important that people understand popular sovereignty is real, but but political association is not necessarily voluntary. I don't know how those two things go together. What I do know is government is only natural when it's small and the size of the country is small. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we keep coming back to the the two core principles of Catholic social teaching, which is the principle of subsidiarity and the principle of solidarity as well. And I think of the two, probably subsidiarity is the most under attack and the one that agrarianism done right does the most to fix agreed agreed my my big problem you know is that it's under attack more squarely by the 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 catholic new right guys the catholic post-liberal guys that they're the ones that just they absolutely hate subsidiarity and that's that's why i'm so suspicious that a return to the land, which I do favor, like the rest of you guys, would do a damn thing. I don't think it can because they think the government can just they think individual rights were made up with Locke and Sydney. That's not right. They, they think the government can do whatever it wants. They think huge nations are natural and good and real. And yeah, so it's, uh, solidarity is often misdefined intentionally. Subsidiarity just means that it's a grave evil. That means a mortal sin. For a more far away, far away government to do something that a more local government should do, which is always the father of the household, right? He can do most stuff for his family. He's the first government. So you don't even need city government for most stuff. It's a grave evil, mortal sin for far away government to do it if it lays in the generic competency of a more local government. And solidarity just means it doesn't mean what, uh, again, the, the post liberals or even the integralists are saying it means. Solidarity just means if you have a system of subsidiarity, which is the the prime rule for Catholic government, then there will be these natural bonds, more fusion rather than fission between people because your your nation will be kinship groups who farm together and, and, and work together and play together and pray together. And so it means that if you do subsidiarity right, solidarity will be the ramification. It means there will be natural bonds between people. I mean, Montesquieu, who often gets attacked as a liberal, he's actually a great Catholic thinker, even though he he was a fallen Catholic and he, he only reconverted on his deathbed. He said, you cannot have small government that's done virtually. Um, he said, basically, uh, you have to have Nations have to be small. That was his first cardinal rule. His second cardinal rule was nations have to be univocal. They have to basically look alike. And most of all, they have to have uh, a civic religion, civic morality. You can't have plurality in a true nation. Those are his two cardinal rules because solidarity is a ramification. It's not a principle. The subsidiarity is the binding principle of good Catholic government, small government, small space. If you have small government, small space, solidarity will arise. How in the hell are we supposed to have solidarity with 350 million other countrymen? This is a joke. It's a fucking joke. I have solidarity with a bunch of Soviet Marxists who hang out in San Francisco or Portland. That's nonsense. They don't they don't have my religion. They hate my religion. They hate my race. They hate everything about me. We don't even come from the same climatic zone and we have no cultures in common. Uh, And and this kind of Mm. semi-globalism is what's being advocated for by people who call themselves nationalists. It's a a real travesty. They need to read their Montesquieu. So what are your thoughts on on, uh, Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I've I've heard that he was heavily influenced by Marx and this whole idea that, you know, we are a United States is false. And the, uh, you know, the whole forcing of the South to abide by the rule of the North um, is what got us into this mess. We are a, a nation of sovereign states and as such should have our own. We do by, you know, the Constitution have our own local governments and our own local cultures. Um, we are not in this together. Uh, so the mantra went during the pandemic. <laughs> Worst tyrant this country ever had. 
and he, he's the real one that that fundamentally changed America from being a subsidiary in place to a play. He had an all Marxist cabinet, by the way. He and Marx both were admirers of one another. He hated subsidiarity. He stood for the opposite of subsidiarity, and he fundamentally changed it. I mean, if I were a a Virginian in you know 1860, I had an official state religion right? The official state sect of Christianity, uh, porn, contraception, uh, sodomy were all outlawed in my state of Virginia. In came Lincoln with the 14th Amendment, which, uh, you know, 14th Amendment was his his work product, even though it, it uh, was ratified two years after he died. And it made it illegal. The federal government could make it now illegal for, for me to have a, a state that has an establishment of religion, it made it illegal for my state to outlaw porn and contraception and sodomy. And this is all under the auspices of Lincoln's hatred, utter loathing for subsidiarity. And, and by the way, Pius IX is the only foreign uh, head of state that ever referred to Jefferson Davis as President Jefferson Davis. Why? Because Pius IX understood the concept of subsidiarity. The term wouldn't be granted until Pius XI later. But Pius IX had literally just had his country, you know, Vatican uh, Vatican City, which was much bigger back then, partly stolen and shrunk and quote unquote unified by the Italian unification, which he understood was exactly like what was going on in America with the South and Lincoln. He so he related to the South. Because this big liberal unification, big nationalism is just globalism. Yeah. He loved the South and what it stood for. Tim, I, I don't want to steal your thunder, but can can we can we try to circle this back just to the um theme that we jumped off with the Catholic land movement and we put a pin in the um integralist stuff or no? Yes, yeah, sure. Roger. So I guess wrapping things up, can we talk about, I'd like to talk about the pragmatics of this. So many times I go ahead and I mention these things to folks and they go, that's impossible. You know, like, what are you, Amish? You know, like you don't know a thing about farming, Mike. You you can shoot a weapon, but you don't know how to hunt, you don't know how to fish, you know, like what what, what are we going to do? This This is, it's the 21st century. We're in it. We're on social media. We're not going back. This is, this is some, this is some pipe dream. This is, this is. You're LARPing. What can we put our heads together for like the remainder of this to talk about like what what would the beginning steps of this actually look like? Like if we took it seriously, what would small steps or or you know, Elliot made mentioned a couple examples of what this could begin looking like. It doesn't have to be full Amish, but like what what would the pragmatic steps could we we point to 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 begin realizing? I think it would have to be uh I think it would have to be pooling resources. I think instead of outsourcing everything to, you know, the supermarket, we would have to have friends and community and we'd have to know people, right? Like that's how societies grew. Hey, you know how to make bread. I know how to make swords. She knows how to tend to children and teach them. He knows how to till the soil. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I kind of started thinking this way because I'm a closet prepper of sorts. And so always waiting for the apocalypse, I'm thinking, well, I got to read a bunch of books about how to survive this damn thing. And the first thing in every single one of those books is, look, hey, you could store as much food as you want. You can build solar panels. You can do all this prepping. But if you don't have a community, you don't have people resources, you're going to suffer because there are things that you just can't do that your neighbor can do. And so you're right. Like, I don't, I'm not very good at um, farming. My dad is, and maybe my neighbor is, and I got cattle ranchers over there, and then maybe they need the help of my family to you know, do X, Y, and Z. So really, you know, back to the land is a little misleading. It's really back to local community. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the land might be the people get, they get intimidated by the land point of it. And what you're saying is that actually, no, it begins with people, it begins with, with community first. And then the, the land thing is probably the, the next piece of the puzzle. Yeah. I think that's really smart. T 10 guys within 10 miles with different skills goes mm -hmm. a long way to making this workable and also accepting that 
economically at least or in terms of material luxury your standard of living might be lower certainly in the short term but that doesn't mean that you haven't got more genuine wealth in other ways so an acceptance that sacrifices are going to be made and you'll have a more simple lifestyle but a better one especially spiritually i was going to say will i'd i'd, I'd actually want to push back a bit on that claim because it's just like how many men do you know that like are sedentary or disconnected from their bodies or disconnected from nature have all these like ridiculous like hobbies or vices that aren't serving them and then you, you see people when they just they get like a, just a taste of exercise or of being out in nature or just they get introduced to fishing for the first time like men are like they're elated they're like oh my you know this this whole world's been opened up and i, I have a friend he um he raises chickens now and he all he does is talk to me about the, about the chickens and it's 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 funny like he, he's just so pulled into it and his quality of life it's 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 night and day in terms of his um his psychology now so i think the um the the skill set and just the, the getting active and and producing something and having those types of connections actually it's um one's quality of life could could surprisingly go up in ways that like going to the getting DoorDash or going to the supermarket is actually dampening in, in a lot of a lot of uh ways that people don't suspect oh yeah they, they sure. haven't seen the alternative yeah i totally agree but when if you if you say to someone why don't you move out of the big city and go and live a more simple lifestyle more connected to the land and try and be a bit more self-reliant out in a rural area they might be thinking but i'll earn less money mm -hmm. right um, yep, yep. but that's not the be all and the end all and you might end up wealthier all things considered mm -hmm. out of the city yes definitely any thoughts on this, Tim? I, yeah, I, I agree that when we compartmentalize and we say, what are the effects on the quality of life of individuals if they get back to the land? I, I think I think you're going to be hard pressed to ever find, I agree with you, an instance of a person that says his quality of life suffers. Um, and I, th I think what we've been talking about through most of, most of the show is, is this LARPing collectively? Right. We mm -hmm. probably should have started with, right. is it LARPing individually? Um, I think the answer to collectively is, yeah, until we until we reform uh, our association. I think it is individually. No, I don't think it is. I think like you're you're going to get joy from doing this. And this is why it's a little until we refashion collectively. I think it, it's going to be more like a hobby. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what you note. It stops being like a hobby. It will actually can 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 become a way of life when we have the kind of association, political association that allows it. But absolutely, men are inherently connected to the land, or maybe not inherently, but strongly, strongly environmentally conditioned to to loving the land. And so, fishing and hunting, even if we pick these things up later in life, because we grew up in cities. I picked up hunting a little later. It's something that you're going to love. And I would imagine it's the same way with the land. Now, I don't I don't do that yet. I don't have chickens, so I, I can't really comment. But everyone I know that's got chickens enjoys it, um, that, which is strong evidence for the claims that you're making. Yeah, yeah. I guess an, another side effect that we, we opened the, the show with about this is that like, if you want to have the luxury of having a a dissonant or heterodox political opinion in this day and age, then you need to be, you need to have some sort of way to feed yourself and to keep the lights on and protect yourself. So I think that, you know, surprisingly, like knowing how to garden could actually be a more politically like robust action than reading a bunch of books. You know, if, if you can actually garden and, 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 you know, actually make stuff grow out of the ground, then you, you can have an opinion in the world. That's like a surprising thing to think about. Yeah. And uh, if you've watched uh, the, the comedian Owen, Owen Benjamin, you know, who critiqued the trans agenda in Hollywood and pretty much got like relegated to the middle of nowhere, um, Washington state, but like he's needed to figure that out and he's on, on a homestead now. And it's like that, 
that consequence might befall all of us at some point. So, you know, it'd be good to have a lot of these, these skills and people around us that have those skills too, in order to have a voice. Yeah. They, they even took his wife off Airbnb. That's how hardcore the cancellation was. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then we're, we're, we're intertwined in all these systems. So then, yeah, they, they flip one switch and then, yeah, you can't get to any of them. There's that meme, isn't there? At some point, don't comply involves don't rely. Mm, I like that. Yeah. Have any of you guys read uh, Don't Live By Lies? Live Not By Lies with Dreher and how he talks mm. about essentially how now we are living under um, how you would say they like quasi fascist, right? Like, so the it's the corporation, the government no longer has to tell us what to do or not to do and punish us. It's Airbnb, it's Google, mm -hmm. it's YouTube, it's these are the these are the organizations that are that we become addicted to. These are the companies we become addicted to their services and their goods. <laughs> and as a result, like you just said, uh, we comply or we suffer. And so, you know, we we give our, we give our loyalty over to these luxuries that essentially then rule our lives until they cut us out. Mm. Definitely. That's the, uh, yeah, that's the bug man. The, but uh, yep. Self-reliance and neighborliness go hand in hand. I think that's the point that Elliot was making earlier about what can people do for each other in the local area. And then that comes back to Tim's point about subsidiarity as well. It's about the local groups where possible fulfilling all those roles instead. That's what, truly matters that's what the principle of agrarianism is really speaking to mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's 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 well said and uh yeah the, the best one of the best best ways to be neighborly and to to feel that you're also like connecting with your neighbors is to know that you're like use, useful to them and mm -hmm. uh they, they in in the event of tragedy or emergency you you could be there to help them and that they they know they can count on you that's like a good feeling to know that you're not the weakest link in the, in the chain, you know, with respect to, to the, um, the community. So I guess as we're wrapping things up, you guys want to go around the horn and give, give some close closing thoughts or comments on this, this theme. I'll just wrap up by saying, I appreciate those who have been watching this series. I've gotten several comments recently and people hitting me up, letting me know how much they really enjoy this. I had no idea. I mean, of course, there are people watching it, but the impact that it's making. So I want to thank you guys for inviting me and for us uh, to be getting together and this commitment every week and doing this. And of course, to all the viewers, thank you for continuing to watch. Mm -hmm. And please share these videos, especially with your friends who you think will benefit from being more manly Catholic men. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, I think the series has been successful so far in a dozen episodes in 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 showing the conceptual connectedness mm -hmm. of, of basically everything we've covered it's all manhood so it, every episode doesn't have to be like the environment and being a man or or you know back to the land and being a man like being a man in the world involves all of these being masculine in the world more specifically involves all of these topics. And uh, maybe people are getting the sense that any good scholar gets when he begins to really look into his dissertation famously is like, Whoa, I I'm learning that I have to zoom in through many, many, many more layers of environment. I was far more zoomed out when I had my master's degree and I thought I knew the further into this I go, the more I realize how little I know, how how vast the the topic of masculinity really is. I, some of us were wondering, can we do a podcast just on masculinity? The podcast within a podcast. And the, the deeper we go, it's like all of these issues co-involve one another. Mm -hmm. And so even that's why even today, it's like, well, you want to talk about back to the land. We have to talk about political associations. We yep. have to talk about uh, rights and duties. And, and that's what, that's what masculinity is really all about is rights and duties. So I think it's been enlightening for me and I, I hope others and like Elliot and Will, I, I thank everyone that's been watching, uh, you know, a, a more experimental type of podcast 
it's it's interesting to learn as we go just how much other stuff is co-involved by masculinity everything because men are the organizing principle of society and being a man is fundamentally a, a call to play a particular kind of role within a family as a father and as soon as you're thinking about that it's the interface between the family and society and then you're into all kinds of questions of political philosophy as well, which is why integralism came up today. And Tim's point about the interconnectedness of the concepts is a really vital one. Yeah, I was going to say the exact same thing. Yeah, the uh, how interconnected and, and like multi-layered all all the all the the nodes that we've been connecting today, and then to the the larger 12, 12 episodes we've done so far. I think, yeah, it's um. There's so many things to cover, but they're all so, so quickly interrelated. And uh, yeah, I think that we've been pulling these these threads together nicely and it's been, it's been a great, great um, project so far. So yeah, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you uh, for folks listening as well. All right, well, uh, that will wrap things up. I'll go ahead and I will close with a Father McNabb quote where he says, the defense of the family's defense of the home the defense of the home is the homestead. So something for you guys to think about as we uh, part on this Friday. And uh, we'll catch you guys later. God bless. God Take bless, care. fellas.